Father, we thank you, and, uh, and I, I, I praise you for the privilege of, of uh, teaching your word here in this place and, and providing some interim pastor, uh, pastoral leadership, and I, I do pray for your blessings here. And I pray for your blessing this evening as we study your word. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we do serve a God who delivers. He answers prayer. He, he responds. And there's times when we see his hand powerfully, powerfully answering prayers. And uh, sometimes we see it in our individual lives. Sometimes we see it in, in our collective lives as, as a church or even in our national experiences where, where God powerfully answers a prayer. Maybe he brings a healing. Maybe he restores a relationship. And as we see these, these are tastes of his character. Of, of his faithfulness, and it fills us with hope that one day he's going to finish the whole project, and he's going to complete the work that he's begun in us. Well, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 147, Psalm 147, <clears throat> one that we don't frequent a whole lot, at least I don't, uh, but it's one that I think is very profound <clears throat> and got some marvelous lessons for us. It's a psalm of praise, and 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 it would be called a psalm of descriptive praise. It starts with a, with a statement that it ends with, praise the Lord. It ends with the same statement, praise the Lord. And I think you know what that would be in Hebrew, right? Hallelujah. We praise the Lord. It's a command to praise Him. It's probably, as you look at clues, there, there's no superscription to this one. So it's just the psalm. And as you look at it, it was probably written in the post-exilic time. Now, if you think about Israel's history, uh, as Israel goes through, and I'm thinking of a time timeline now, you're, you're, you're marching through the history of the Old Testament, and you come to the period of, of, of the kings, where you've got, got Saul and David and Solomon, and, and that was the monarchy where Israel was a united nation. After Solomon's reign, the nation split into two halves, and now you've got the northern part and the southern part. The northern part called Israel, the southern, the southern part of the nation took the name Judah, and, and, and the, the Old Testament history continues on for a while. The northern nation was taken captive to Assyria. The southern nation continued a while longer until the year 586 B.C., 586 years before Christ. That is when the Babylonians came down and conquered uh, the southern nation of Judah. They destroyed uh, the city of Jerusalem. They took the majority of, of the Jews there uh, as prisoners of war, and they took them back to Babylon. And, and they also smashed the temple. So temple worship had come to a complete stop. And at that point, it looked as though the nation, its history was finished. Because oftentimes when nations would be invaded and, and destroyed like that, uh, they would never be seen again. But God had made promises to his people. And he preserved his people, even uh, so many of them living in Babylon. And, uh, and, and, the, and the, the small remnant that was left in the land was there in an amazing way that the Lord, in his, according to his prophetic timetable and his prophetic promise, uh, he allowed a group of, of, of people to return after that exile and to rebuild the temple, uh, to rebuild the, the walls of the city. And it seems that it's after this when they compose this psalm. And the reason, as you see verses like verse 2, that the Lord builds up Jerusalem and he gathers the outcasts of Israel, gathers them back to the land. Or you look at verse uh, 13, uh, where he says, he strengthens the bars of your gates, he blesses your children within you. So it's his blessing where he's strengthening the city and strengthening the nation. So it would seem very likely to have been composed later in Israel's history, perhaps, perhaps, Nehemiah 12, where there was that dedication. You remember when Nehemiah led the rebuilding of the walls around the city of Jerusalem, and they dedicated the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the project that they had done there, and, and he appointed uh, choirs to go up on one side and on another side up on these high walls to sing praise, and they had a joyous uh, celebration of praise. This psalm would have fit marvelously with that. And so it could be that it was composed with something like that. But as I look at it, I realize that this was an answer to prayer for the people of Israel. It's not the ultimate fulfillment that we're looking for still today, but it is a fulfillment 
It's a taste of that faithful God who continues to work in his nation, in his people, and he continues to work in his church, uh, in you and me. It's an amazing, almost miraculous restoration that the nation experienced. Their capital was restored, their temple was restored. Not the final promised blessing, but it shows God has not given up on his chosen people. Uh, one commentator says it may have been composed, he thinks, a man by the name of Anderson, uh, it may have been composed for the Pe Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, that was the Feast of Booths, where they would build these little, little, and the Jews still do it today, uh, uh, many places. I remember one time I was painting uh, over in, in, in the Ada area, and I was driving to, it was, I, I had actually gone and gotten some lunch, and I was coming back, and I was behind a pickup truck, and I looked, and there's a man sitting in the back of the pickup truck, this open pickup, and he had this contraption sitting back there that looked kind of thrown together. And I thought, what in the world is this? And all of a sudden, I looked and realized this is a Jew. It could be because, because the way he was, he was dressed, he was clearly an Orthodox Jew. And uh, he's sitting there with, with this, this makeshift uh, uh, tent-looking thing and that he was bringing back to his house that was for, and it was October, and I thought certainly it was the Feast of Tabernacles, and so he was going to, to be observing that. And so uh, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, the themes of Psalm 147 fits almost perfectly with it because that's a time when, when the nation celebrates God's providential care, especially in the wilderness. That's why they build these little things to live in for a week. Uh, they, 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 they celebrate God's providence and his care and his, his provision for them. Uh, they also celebrate the harvest coming in and they also uh, 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 as, they, as they celebrate this celebrate the fact that God gave his law during that time when the nation was in the wilderness and so all these things all these themes are ro woven right into Psalm 147 now it's interesting as I think about that because the Feast of Tabernacles, seven days, then there's an eighth day, a special celebration, Simchat Torah, when the people of Israel rejoice in the Lord. And it's a, a day set aside. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a solemn day. No work is to be done. We're to, they are to rejoice and celebrate God. And it's sobering as I think about that. The reason I bring it up, because that was October 7 this year. That is when Hamas decided to invade Israel and have that terrorist operation right when the nation was celebrating. And not that all of the nation was doing it religiously, but, but it was a time set aside to delight in the God who provides for them when they were caught unaware and, uh, and, and, and experienced that. So anyway, um, could be a Feast of Tabernacles celebration. Regardless, it's praise after you taste of God's power to restore. And so we can enter into this as well. There's three rounds of praise. Each one begins with a call to praise. And, and, and the very first words, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And then he begins to give the reason. First reason, these are in the first uh, uh, six verses, is that he heals the brokenhearted. He heals the brokenhearted. He heals and restores them. And we've got the call where he says, praise the Lord. And sometimes in churches there's a call to worship. And sometimes it's a red call to worship. Sometimes it's sung. But it's a call. Well, let's worship God. Praise Him. Worship Him. And that's what the psalmist says. Praise the Lord. And that's a command. And then he gives the reason why. For it is good to sing praises to our God. Good has the idea of it's pleasant, it's fitting. Actually, that's where he goes in the remainder of the verse. It is pleasant. A song of praise is fitting. It's delightful. How delightful. Surely it's a delightful thing to praise God. Derek Kid Kidner in his commentary says, Praise must always be a whole offering. You do think of praise as an offering, right? An offering where you're presenting something. And he says it's a whole offering biblically affirming that my whole life be belongs to God. Praise is not just a thank you. It's, it's a, a recognition that, that, that my entire life belongs to God. It's for His purposes. And so when I praise God, my focus is not on me, it's on Him. And I'm looking to the God who's provided. And it's, it's as I reflect on His pure glory and His pure goodness, what does it do to my heart? It invigorates it, it's, it's, it's thrilling, it's pleasant, it's, it's wonderful. And if given a chance, what would you, what would I most like to do? Sit in front of the TV, eat pizza, go for a walk, 
or praise God. Well, a person who loves the Lord, to praise Him, it lifts and, and, and encourages the heart like nothing else. Uh, let me read these verses, verses 2 to 6, and just notice what it describes the Lord doing. He says, verse 2, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble, but he casts the wicked to the ground. As I look at these words, I'm struck by three things that I see. Letter A, it recalls the covenant agreement that God had with Israel. It recalls the covenant. What is the covenant agreement? I'm glad you asked. Turn, put your finger here and turn back to the book of Deuteronomy if you can. Deuteronomy 28. I think these are arguably some of the most important chapters in the entire Old Testament. And uh, what they do is they set the context for all of the rest of the Old Testament. This is the book of Deuteronomy was spoken by Moses to the people of Israel. It was right before Moses died and the people of Israel entered the promised land. And what he does is he summarizes all of the law from Genesis through Numbers. He summarizes it and gives it to the new generation. Remember the, the generation that, that refused to go into the promised land? Uh, all of those that were 40 years uh, 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 and older died. Uh, in that, in any way, uh, he's, he's teaching the, the newer generation, basically the, the law of God. And this is the summary of it. Look at what it says, chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, verse 1. And if, I've got that circled in my Bible, important if, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments that I set before you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed you shall be in the city. Blessed sh uh, shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the, the, the ground and the fruit of the cattle, uh, the increase of your herds, the young of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl, blessed shall be you when you come in, blessed shall be you when you go out, and on and on and on. As you are faithful to me, the Lord says, I will bless you and bless you and bless you to where you're the envy of all the nations of the earth. Uh, he talks about military blessing. He talks about security of, of the nation and, and prosperity and, and all of the things, rain and crops and all the things he'll bring. Verse 15 is the other side. But if, and I've got that one circled too, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments in his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And he'll give, and he, he, he lists basically the opposite of what he's just described. In every area, agriculturally, militarily, uh, politically, socially, religiously, in every area, they're going to have confusion and trouble. The, the sky is going to be like bronze. It's not going to rain. They're just going to have just heartache and problems. And he says, then I'm going to bring in foreign nations who are going to conquer you. Your military is going to be weak. You're not going to be able to have success over them. And you're going to be taken as captives to foreign lands. And he goes through all of this stuff that's going to happen if they do not obey. Now, I'm telling you, that's the story of the entire Old Testament. That's the story of the history of the nation of Israel. It really is. As you read through the Old Testament, they had a few times when they would turn to the Lord and experience His blessing. The majority of the time, it was hard. It was difficult. And what did the prophets speak when they came forth and they began to preach to the nation of Israel? Repent. Look at all the hardship that's come upon you. Repent. There's a reason why all of this is happening. You're not following the Lord. You're, you're following idols. You're, you're, you're following your own devices. And then after the nation was conquered, taken captive, what was the message? Hope is not gone yet. Turn back to God. He'll turn back to you. Now turn to chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. Moses speaking prophetically. Chapter 30, verse 1. And when, I've got that word circled in my Bible as well, and when, not if, 
This is a win. When all these things come on you, the blessings and the curses, Moses knows the nation is going to disobey. They are going to experience a lot of the curses and the hardships. When these curses have come and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, scattered you all throughout the nations, and then when you return to the Lord your God, what's another word for return? Repent. That's right. When they repent you and your children and when you obey his voice and all that I command you today with all of your heart with all of your soul then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes restore that's a word that we see in Psalm 147 he will have mercy on you he will gather that's another word we see in Psalm 147 gather you from all the peoples where the Lord has scattered you and even if you're outcast are in the uttermost parts of heaven from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you back into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and that you may live. That's the hope. There you go. That's the whole story of Israel right there in a nutshell. And when you look at that, uh, when you're reading any prophet, is this the first part of chapter 28? Is this the latter, pass, latter part of chapter 28, or is this chapter 30? And you can stick it almost in, in those three envelopes. Uh, that's what you have. And as I read Psalm 147, you can look back there. When I look at verse 2, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. That's the language of restoration after the nation is turned to him. So it's, it recalls God's covenant agreement. It also recalls the promise of the prophets. Look at Isaiah, if, if you can turn there as well. The book of Isaiah, as I said, takes these very same themes and just brings it forth. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 12. The same language is used because Isaiah says God's going to do this. In Isaiah eleven twelve. Oh goodness gracious. I'm in the book of Psalms. Okay, Isaiah. I can't even find books in my own Bible. All right. Isaiah eleven, verse twelve. This looks a whole lot better. He will raise a signal for the nations and he will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. He's going to gather them. And I can read you some others. Uh, Isaiah 56, 8 uses very similar language as well. In fact, let's just look over there. Isaiah 56. Verse 8. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. I'm going to gather Israel. So it's the promise of the prophets. We've got statements where, where in the psalm it says he gathers the outcasts, he builds up. Uh, if this was during Nehemiah's time, it could be building up in the sense of building a wall uh, like Nehemiah did or, or continually causing the nation to flourish. When it says that he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds, that's figurative language. Uh, it could include building of lives, rebuilding of families, healing of relationships. Uh, Hosea 6.1, another prophet says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us. Let's return that he may heal us. He has struck us down, but he will bind us up. Same language. So, so as, as the Israelites were singing Psalm 147, if they had knowledge, and many of them did, of the prophets, they were thinking of all of these words that were in the covenant, also that were promised by the prophets. And then it goes even further than that. We begin thinking of the ministry of Jesus himself, which would have been later than Psalm 147, obviously. Uh, when, when Psalm 147, uh, look at Psalm 147 now, um, verse 3, when it says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. 
Do you remember Isaiah 61? Jesus one day in Luke chapter 4, he, he's in, in the synagogue in his hometown of, of Nazareth, and, and the, as, as the Lord providentially had it, that was the reading in the synagogue that day from Isaiah 61. Jesus was invited to read it, so he turned to Isaiah 61 and he read, The Spirit of the Lord God is on me. And Jesus is saying, it's talking about me. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, same language, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus quotes this and says, this is me. So as you start reading these verses in Psalm 147, 2 and 3 of how God is gathering, this is the fulfillment of the covenant. This is the fulfillment of the promise of the prophets. And this is exactly what we saw happening in the life of Jesus during his first ministry in Israel. And guess what? It's going to happen one day when he comes back. So this is the whole picture that we're seeing here. It recalls the covenant. Remember Jesus' words, Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the poor in spirit. When he's talking about these people, this is what Jesus brings. So it recalls the covenant agreement. Letter B, it affirms God's infinite power and his understanding. So it, 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 it recalls that covenant, but it affirms that he's all-powerful. He can do this. And it's displayed by the way he, he, he sustains the universe. Look at verse 4. He determines the number of stars. How many stars are there? Nobody has any guess. There are just billions of them. He determines exactly how many. And he gives to each of them a name. Wow. That's, and, and, and when it talks about naming things, that's a sign of lordship. I uh, remember in Genesis when Adam was told to name the animals. It was, it was a sign of dominion that, that God had given to him over the animal life. Uh, in the ancient world, the stars were worshipped. But this says God is the one who controls them. He names them. He numbers them. He's in control of all of it. And then look at verse 5. Great is our Lord, abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. So God has got the power. He's got the wisdom to pull this off. He can make the impossible happen. He has no limit. He's infinite. So, as I look at this, this first section of praise, it's based on the covenant agreement. It remembers the covenant agreement. It affirms God's infinite power, but it has a condition. Can you sense what that condition is? You might, as you're thinking, as we read through the covenant agreement. Remember, if you obey... If you disobey, and they disobeyed, and then when you repent. Notice the words. He heals the brokenhearted. Look at verse 6. The Lord lifts up the humble. What is that implying? Just somebody who, who thinks they're no good? No. This is a humble person who humbly repents before God, humbles himself before God, saying, You are in charge of my life. I give my life to you. I turn to you. And so the implied condition is a humble, broken repentance, a turning to God. And for us who know that He sent, the God of Israel sent His Son, the Lord Jesus, it's a turning to His Son, Jesus. Um, even as I look at 6, verse 6, look at the contrast. The Lord lifts up the humble. What's the contrast? He casts the wicked down. That lets you know that when He's talking about the humble, He's not just talking about somebody with a low self-esteem. He's talking about a humble person who is turning in righteousness to God. So, so that is the condition we see. Um, I can't help but think of the song of Mary. Do you remember after, after the angel appeared to her and she gave forth her marvelous Magnificat, her song of praise? Luke 1.52, He, the Lord God, has brought down rulers from their thrones, but He has lifted up the humble. Mary was a humble. She was just a lowly girl, but she was a lowly girl who loved the Lord God and had committed her life to Him and was marveling at the way that God lifts up the humble, even making her the mother of the Messiah. So God's righteousness works both ways. 
And so the condition is, repent, turn to him. You won't know his blessing apart from that. So praise. He heals the brokenhearted. There's another reason to praise. And look at verse 7. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. So it's a, a, an instrument, a stringed instrument that might have been a little bit like a guitar or a banjo or something. A few more strings, though. But uh, um, make melody to God and sing praises. And then he gives a second reason. Because he takes pleasure in those who fear him. God takes pleasure in those who fear him. This is verses 7 to 11. And we're told to give musical praise. The reason, letter A, the first reason, he cares for all of creation. He cares for all of creation. Verse 8, he covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. Now, we may get tired of rain sometimes in Michigan. In the Middle East, rain is a sign of blessing. And I tell you what, if it doesn't rain, it could be trouble. And I remember the last time I was there, I was privileged to worship in a, in a church uh, uh, of uh, a lot of Israelis, but, but there were other expatriates there as well. But they had a prayer request time, and one lady, one Jewish lady that raised her hand immediately, and it was in the end of November. And she said, we, better, we need to be praying for rain because we need it right now. And that was a few years back, but uh, it made me think how important rain is there. It says he gives beasts their food, verse 9, and to the young ravens that cry, even to ravens, um, he cares for creation. But letter B, while he cares for all of creation, letter B, his special delight is for those who fear him. His special delight is for those who fear him. This is the high point of the whole psalm. This is the central lesson. Look at the way it's phrased. Verse 10, his delight is not in the strength of a horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. What in the world is that talking about? You know, you got great legs, right? Well, what's he talking about? I think he's talking militarily. These were the military weapons. You know, you've got a horse that you can use that's it's effective in battle. You've got our, uh, troops which are swift and they can run and they can get to the destination. And, and he's saying the Lord's delight is not... Because look at the great army Israel has been, made, been able to make. I take great delight in you. Look how great you are. Um, that's not what God delights in. He doesn't delight in our resources and our abilities. He doesn't look at you and say, you're so strong. You're so fast. You're so smart. You're so, so intelligent. I really take special interest in you. What does he delight in? Not that. The Lord delights in, he takes pleasure in those who fear him. Now think about that. Delights, takes pleasure in. Are those words that you often grab onto when you think about our God? Can you picture God up there delighting, taking pleasure in somebody? You know, my mind goes to, to a grandparent taking special delight in their grandchild laughing, slapping their, lap, their, their leg with joy as they're seeing what that little child is doing. God delights in his people like that. Does that change your estimation of God a little bit? But what type of people does he specifically delight in? What draws his favor? What draws his delight? It's not our great abilities, not our resources, our cunning, our smarts, everything else, nor our military. Nothing against that, but... That's not what it brings. What brings his delight? Those who fear and trust him. That language makes us jump a little bit. Those who fear him? Sounds a little strange, huh? Does God want us to be afraid of him? To draw back in terror? Like, oh, you're scary. Is that what God wants? No. Because fear has a parallel in this very next line. Those who fear him, the next line, in those who who hope in his steadfast love. So fear and hope go together, right? Fear of God does not mean that we're terrified of him. It means that we have a proper estimation of him. We see him properly as he really, truly is. And if we see him properly, we will obey. We will trust. We don't want to be on his wrong side. Pleasing him is our first and only concern. And we're not relying on ourselves. We're seeking to please Him. 
We're seeking to trust His promises. He wants us to fear Him. Why does God want us to fear Him? Not because He's on an ego trip, but because it's right. He's God, and it's healthy for us. It's right. It's proper. It's, it's the way, it's the pathway to blessing. When it talks about those who hope in His love, that word is a waiting that's characterized by, by expectancy and eagerness and assurance. Faith that's standing on tiptoes looking for the fulfillment that God's going to bring. Psalm 33, 18 says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, those who hope in His steadfast love. Does that characterize your heart? Does it characterize mine? Are we hoping in Him? Are we fearing Him? Trusting in His love? If so, God's eye is right on you. And His hand is on your life. These are the people who experience God's help. <clears throat> who does? People who know they need His help. <laughs> and they turn to Him. And they fear and trust Him. So, praise God, he heals the brokenhearted. Sing to God, he takes pleasure in those who fear him. One more call to praise, look down at verse 12. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. That's another synonym for Jerusalem, the hill on which the city of Jerusalem was, was built. Why should we praise him? He sends forth his powerful word. He sends forth his powerful word. Verses 12 to 14, this is letter A again, if you're taking, taking notes, he gives abundant blessing. Uh, kind of like what we saw back in verses 7 and 8. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. He strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses the children within you. He makes peace uh, in your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. And so he brings blessing on his people. Israel, in this case. His people, the church, in our case. He gives abundant blessing. When he says he, he, he brings peace to your borders, that's the national borders, lasting peace. Who else could bring that in the Middle East of all places with Israel? But he brings peace. That's what God does. How does he operate? How does he bring peace to you, to me? How does he do this? Letter B, the agent is his powerful word. So he gives abundant blessing, letter A. Letter B, the agent is his powerful word. And the idea keeps appearing of his word. Let me read it. I'll try to emphasize the references to his word. See if you pick it up. Verse 15, he sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down these crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes, his rules to Israel. He's not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Do you get the idea? It's emphasizing his word over and over and over. We see a few things about his word. It's effective. Look at verse 15. He sends his command to the earth and his word runs swiftly. That is strange language. Do your words run swiftly? You say, well, they come out swiftly. Yeah, mine do too. But they don't run around after they're out. Um, his speech, his word, it reminds me of, of, of uh, the, the words of the, the, that uh, Isaiah speaks in Isaiah 55, and actually the, the words that the Lord speaks. Great chapter, Isaiah 55, verse 8. Listen to this description of the word of God. Actually, I'm going to start 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Familiar words. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. That's the, really the theme of Psalm 147. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And then God speaks, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And listen to this, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and they do not return there, but they water the earth. They make it 
bring forth and sprout. They give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. The, the eater. So shall my word be that goes from my mouth. My word, it will not return to me empty. My word will accomplish that which I purpose. It shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. I speak, says God. My word goes out. My word accomplishes what I sent it to do, and my word comes back to me. Now, this week, I had to take care of a lot of leaves. We've got a lot of trees behind our property and try to clear it, and there was a pile of leaves there. Now, what I did not do was sit in the house and send out my word, say, leaves, go. And my words didn't run out there and gather up all the leaves and take them off my yard. My words don't do that. But somehow God's words, when he speaks, they run out. His word does, accomplishes the purpose, and comes back. So his word is effective. His word is also authoritative. Look at verse 16. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. You know, the big snowflakes that come down like crumbs. And then he sends out his word, his breath, and he melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow after the snow melts. What can we do to control the weather? Nothing. Maybe there's something that we could do if we drop some major bomb. I don't know. But the weather is the weather. God determines what's going to be, and that's what it is. His word is kind of like that when it brings snow. Even in Israel. You say, does it snow in Israel? Once in a great while. It does in Jerusalem. Once in a great while you'll see pictures of a snowfall. But very, very rare. Uh, in the north you'll get more snow. But... Uh, it's authoritative, just like weather. Who can stop it? And weather can bring us to a complete standstill if God wants to do that. So his word, um, it's authoritative. It's also uniquely revealed to his people. Verse 19, he declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. Those are both synonyms for the people of Israel. He declares this. He's given his word to them. By his word, he controls nature, and yet he's given his word to his people. That's an amazing way to think about it. And then he says his statutes and his rules he's given to Israel. Statutes, rules, does that sound wonderful? Don't think of his laws as a heavy burden. A way to view God's law, his word, it's a pathway to life, to blessing. That's why he's given it to us. That's why the psalmist says, I delight in your law. God has shown us the way to joyful life, and he's shown us the pitfalls to avoid. And he says, this has been done for no other nation. Praise the Lord. And the conclusion is the same place where we started the psalm. Praise the Lord. So God restores. He heals a broken heart, and he takes pleasure in those who fear him. He gives, sends forth his powerful word. From a New Testament perspective, what do we do with this? Well, it's hard not to see all this reference to the active, dynamic power of the Word and not begin to think, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the living Word. The Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And by Him, all things were made that were made. He's the Creator God, but Jesus is called the Word. I think of Hebrews 1, long ago at many times and in various ways God spoke to our fathers way back then by the prophets, but in these last days he's spoken to us by or literally in his son, that living word, the one who he has appointed heir of all things through whom he has also created the world. And this word is the radiance of the very glory of God, is the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he inherited is excellent than theirs. What Hebrews 1, 1 to 4 is saying is this eternal word, this eternal son, he holds the universe together. That's the powerful word of God. He's the one who created the 
universe in the first part. He's the one who holds it together now. He's the one who came into our world, provided cleansing for our sins. His sacrifice was sufficient, and he's seated at the right hand of God in heaven. How does God restore? How does God heal? Through his word, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the psalm is fulfilled in. The Lord Jesus. As I look at Psalm 147, my thought goes one more place. I think of the modern nation of Israel, especially in these days with what they are experiencing. And the things that we've talked about, I think, apply very quickly and very clearly there. God is a God who restores, he regathers his people, takes them from the ends of the earth. Has that happened yet? Not yet. There's a remarkable thing that's happened, the establishing of the modern nation of Israel, but right now the stats are about half, about 50% of Jews worldwide are in Israel. That's significant. But 50% aren't there. They're all over the place in different places. In modern nation, the modern nation of Israel is not a theocracy like it was in the Old Testament, ruled by God. It is a secular nation. It's a democracy. The modern nation of Israel is not in repentance. It's one of the neediest mission fields on the planet. It really is. When you look at the number of Christians among the Jews in Israel, there's very few. It's growing. There's things happening. But it's not a nation in repentance. There's a lot of immorality. Uh, and it's a largely a secular nation. But God is faithful to his promise. And as we look at the nation there, we know he's sustaining the Jewish people for a purpose. Fulfillment is coming one day. But what are we looking for? What are we looking forward to? Zechariah 12.10 describes the nations gathered for the great final battle. God intervenes. And in 12 verse 10 the Lord says, through Zechariah, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. That's what we're looking forward to. That's when he's going to heal the brokenhearted, bind up their wounds, lift up the humble. In Israel. Doesn't mean that every last one will come to faith, but a good majority, a solid number of the Jewish people, we believe, will turn to him. How do we support Israel now? What do we do? Well, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but what does that involve praying for? Repentance of the nation, so that they can receive that blessing because the covenant promises still hold. And God still says, when the nation that's dispersed all over repents, I'll gather them and bring them back in blessing. The nation is there right now because, humanly speaking, the United Nations put them there in the Middle East and there is no peace. There's strife and turmoil continually. But when the nation turns to God, that's when they will be there under peace. So we pray for them. We help them. We know they're targets of Satan. We're targets of the evil one who knows that they've got a significant role in God's plan. But even as we help them, we're very aware that God loves the Palestinian people too. Many of them are, or some of them are believers. Uh, and we pray for the gospel to go forth. And we realize that there's a lot of people suffering on both sides. And we pray for them as well. So those are just a few thoughts about the nation of Israel, even as we look at Psalm 147. For you and me, <clears throat> praise Him for your experience of God's gracious provision. You've tasted it, haven't you? At various times in life, you've tasted a faithful God who's provided for you, provides for your church. He's faithful. He's good. Praise Him. Take a moment to think about how God provides and praise Him. The experience is not complete until we've praised God. When God delivers, when God does something, it's not complete because praise is when we begin to process that, we begin to learn from it. Praise Him. And praise His character. Because whatever God does, He's showing something of who He is. So don't just say, oh, look at these goodies you've given me. 
look to heaven and say, look at who you are. That's what Psalm 147 says. It's talking about the kind of a God he is and what he does. So praise him, praise his character, and then obediently and humbly trust him for the future. If God provides at different junctures throughout life, as I'm stumbling and bumbling, Sometimes I fail him and I have to come back and I have to confess my sins before him and get right with him again and, and move on. And God is still showing me his faithfulness. What does that mean? He's got hold of me. And the fulfillment's coming. It's coming. So be filled with hope and look to the future and walk closely with him. Let's pray. Father, you're a faithful God. You're a glorious God. You're a powerful God. You're all wise. We, your people, are needy, and we turn to you again, even right now, with hearts that are filled with humility, recognizing we don't deserve your, your grace, but we turn to you with repentant hearts, asking for your blessing, and we praise you that you're a gracious, merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. We pray also for the nation of Israel, as has already been prayed. We pray for all the people involved in that conflict on both sides. We pray that you'd bring good out of this. We pray that you would show yourself, cause the gospel to spread, people to come to faith. We pray that you would cast the wicked to the ground. We believe there is real evil that is operating there as well. And uh, I pray that you would deal with the Hamas organization, the Islamic terrorists, and remove that as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.